Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, many thanks to the organizers of uh, this workshop at uh, the European Control Conference for inviting me. Um, um, I must say it's the first time that I have to pre-record a video for a conference presentation. Uh, I hope it's uh, going to be as much uh, fun for you watching it as much fun has been for me uh, doing this at the moment. So today we're going to talk about uh, decision trees and neural networks and how we can capture with uh, their help uh, previously intractable constraints and convert them to a mixed integer uh, linear program. And we're going to apply that to power system optimization considering dynamic stability constraints. So what is the main takeaway of this presentation? Uh, we have uh, uh, several optimization problems that, for example, the ones that are applying to dynamic systems that uh, require constraints that are uh, described by differential equations. And these constraints are uh, actually intractable, right? So what we propose here is to uh, use decision trees uh, and neural networks to capture the feasible space that's characterized by all these constraints. So both linear, both uh, nonlinear constraints and intractable constraints based, for example, on differential equations. And then through an exact transformation, we can transform the information and code it in a decision tree on a neural network to a set of a mixed integer uh, linear constraints. And through that, now we're able to solve a MILP uh, problem uh, that has encoded all these constraints that have been previously intractable. OK. so. Um, so the outline of my presentation, uh, first I'm going to talk a bit about the guiding example because we need a problem where we are going to apply uh, these techniques. And then I'm going to talk about how we convert uh, from decision trees to MILP and how we convert uh, from uh, neural networks to, to MILP. So uh, first of all, let's talk a bit about uh, uh, power, power systems, right? So power system optimization is primarily used for electricity markets and more recently also for load minimization and other functions. So the actual feasible region of, of power systems is actually non-convex and is characterized also by, by, by differential equations, actually, if you want to consider the, the stability of the operating points. So however, what electricity markets do is, is they consider just the largest convex feasible region uh, because that's what's com computationally tractable, and they solve a MILP due to block offers and, and, and other uh, um, um, characteristics. So, but what, what happens because of that is that we're missing parts of the feasible region that can contain more uh, optimal points. So our goal here is to find a computationally tractable way to consider the actual feasible region um, of the power systems uh, that also contains all these different constraints and, uh, and, and solve a MILP, right? So let's go and see how this uh, uh, feasible region uh, uh, looks like. So the original feasible region is characterized by operating points that satisfy the AC power flow equations. And this makes them, because these are quadrat constraints, this makes them, uh, makes this feasible region a non a linear, non convex um, a, a set. Uh, also, if, if we add the component limits, and we also have to add the component limits to that. Right? Now, on top of that, we have to limit this feasible region because we have to take into account security criteria. So, for example, the N-1 security criterion, which uh, is uh, characterized by sets of nonlinear algebraic inequality constraints, limits uh, this uh, uh, feasible region to, to, to a subregion. Right? At the same time, we also have stability constraints. So the stability constraints limit this feasible region to another subregion. Now, electricity markets and optimization problems in power systems, they have to take the intersection uh, of those different security criteria. So they have to find the optimal operating point inside this intersection. Now, the problem uh, for that is that this is usually impossible uh, because this contains, as we said, also uh, a set of differential uh, and nonlinear algebraic equations, which uh, uh, make it very uh, hard to solve. So what we propose here, so before we go to what we propose, so what is happening at the moment for electricity markets is, for example, in the Nordic market at the moment, uh, the, they use linear approximations um, uh, based on this net transfer capacity that can either be inaccurate or they can be too conservative. 
uh, in the Central European market, um, uh, people tried to uh, uh, identify the single convex, convex region and allow the electricity market uh, operating points to be inside this single convex region and disregarding uh, parts of possible operating points or feasible operating points um, where we might find even a, a better optimal solution but the, that they are not in this single uh, convex region. So what we propose uh, uh, here is that uh, instead we uh, create a database of secure and insecure uh, operating points and for example this can uh, uh, part of it can be based on historical data by by TSOs the transmission system operators but uh, they, they can also be generated on uh, on this uh, uh, large sets of uh, simulation data that all operators have uh, to assess the security um, of the possible operating points from that we can train a decision tree or a neural network that is able to classify uh, these points to safe and unsafe and infer the true uh, stable or secure region. And now through this exact transformation we can transform these uh, constraints or this information if you want to constraints uh, that fit into a mixed integer linear program. Right? So let's uh, see uh, first how we can do that with decision trees. So uh, having this database uh, of stable and unstable operating points, we uh, train the decision tree. And uh, in that case, every leaf node is actually, uh, as you see here, uh, corresponding to uh, a convex subregion of the true uh, stability region, right? So by training this tree, we have each a different leaf node corresponding to this and this, uh, and the union of those leaf nodes actually corresponds to the whole um, uh, stable region. This is actually uh, real uh, data from, from, from a, a 14 bus system. Um, so having now encoded uh, this information into the decision tree, it's straightforward to convert this information to a mixed integer linear program. And then I can solve uh, a MILP if we're talking about a DC optimal power flow where we have a linearized equality constraints. I, I, I should solve a mixed integer nonlinear program if the equality constraints uh, are um, are the original quadratic power flow equations, or I can also I can also do a relaxation uh, and and convexify the problem so in order to have a mixed integer second order cone or quadratic convex. So I'm going to show you some results. Um, first of all, uh, what I'm going to show is that instead of having the the largest convex region, as currently happening in the electricity markets, we can now actually capture the full true feasible region, right? So by doing that, we see this is a, these are a real data from the 14 bus system. The largest convex region for this system that would have been considered in electricity markets would have covered about 78% of the true feasible region. So by uh, with using this technique, we, we expand uh, the permissible points uh, and we gained 22% of the feasible space uh, that was uh, discarded uh, um, initially. At the same time, in this different space, there can be uh, operating points that, have a, uh, that result to, let's say, a lower uh, uh, cost of the objective function so that we are, we are actually able to find the true global optimum. And indeed, in this case, the global optimum is not in the um, in the largest convex region, but rather in in, in, a, in another leaf node. Uh, and uh, with this um, uh, technique and using a mixed integer second order cone uh, uh, relaxation, we can actually find better solution than than uh, the non-convex problem. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the, the, the main uh, idea of how the, this technique can work with decision trees. Uh, I'm also going to discuss a bit how this works with the uh, neural networks, um, which is a more uh, recent work uh, for us. So um, exactly what we do with decision trees, we can do something very similar with neural networks. And the reason is the following. Neural networks are uh, actually characterized by uh, linear weights and the nonlinear activation function. Now, recently, and by recently I mean the, the, the past couple of years, 
the most popular nonlinear activation function that has been used is the ReLU. The ReLU is, uh, stands for Rectifier uh, Linear Unit. And what this is, is, is a piecewise linear function. Uh, so if the input is positive, uh, then the output is exactly the same as the input. If the input is negative, uh, then the output is equal to zero. So we can um, encode uh, this nonlinear activation function through a max operator, right? So in the end, the, the neural networks that we can use or that we use uh, in, in several cases, they uh, are characterized by linear weights and by this max operator function. And it is straightforward for us to convert this uh, uh, max operator to a mixed integer linear program. So this has been already used for neural network verification and we have also done some work on that. Uh, but we can also use this um, and uh, 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 we can also use this for capturing constraints or maybe correlations or insights that are impossible to capture in any other ways. We are able to capture this through the neural network and then convert this information into an actual constraint, an analytical constraint inside the mixed integer uh, linear program. This can, can, have, can become actually really, really powerful. So, um, before going into um, how we formulate the problem, let me just also add one more thing. Uh, and this is, has to do with the output because it's important for the next slide. So the output vector for us, so here's a classification. So the, the output of the neural networks, I'll say if an input is feasible to the optimization problem or infeasible, right? So we encode the output in an output vector Y with two elements, Y1 and Y2, okay? So if y1 is larger than y2, then the input that we entered in the neural network is uh, classified as safe, is considered safe. If y2 is larger than y1, then it's considered unsafe. And we're going to take this uh, uh, inequality as well and include it in, in, our, uh, um, in our MILP uh, as also in, in the next uh, uh, slide. So what happens here is, first again, as a similar decision trees, we generate a database of secure and insecure operating points, but now we can add whatever combination of dynamic uh, and, and static security criteria we want, right? The advantage here is that uh, this, this, the, the scale of the neural network does not need to increase, so the size of the neural network does not need to increase in the same way uh, uh, that it would have increased if we added one constraint after the other in an optimization problem, right? So we can add whatever constraints we want in our oper in our, uh, for our operating points and classify them. Then we train the neural network and maybe similar sizes of neural networks can classify sets of many different security criteria, right? Um, so it might be uh, which we haven't tested that yet, but this is one of the uh, things that we plan to do in the future. It might be also more scalable. But let's see now here what happens with uh, uh, this process. So we encode the information to the neural network. And from that, because we're talking about linear weights and, uh, and a max operator, uh, as you see here, we convert that to a mixed integer linear program. So this whole process is, is done in order to get from uh, an input uh, u which is actually characterized by pg and vg to an output y and the final constraint is that if y1 is larger than y2 then this operating point is feasible so it can be considered in our uh, optimization right so this whole set can um, uh, can be used to to solve the meet now there are two challenges here uh, that I'm going to talk about. Uh, and then the first is how do we ensure that the feasible region is uh, captured accurately by the neural network? The second is how do we handle the nonlinear equality constraints? Because we haven't talked about this if we have nonlinear equality constraints. So let's go to the challenge number one. So as you see here, there's always going to be some kind of estimation error or prediction error uh, with uh, the neural network. So here again, these are uh, data from a, a small system. Uh, you can see that the blue dots is the 
the true uh, feasible points, the red dots are the true infeasible points. Now, the, the gray area is what we would have ideally wanted the neural network to uh, infer, to come up with. So this is the true feasible region, this gray area, right? Now, the, the, the neural network that we train uh, has a, uh, a slight mismatch, so you can see that uh, the, uh, the estimated area that this neural network has is this black uh, dust line. So inside this black dust line, where you see there's a slight mismatch. So what we propose here, uh, in order to um, uh, achieve that we have 100% accuracy, um, or let's say that we obtain an optimal point that is uh, feasible, is to add the small conservativeness. So what we do is we reduce these bounds slightly. Uh, we call that epsilon conservativeness, right? So we add a small epsilon in this inequality here that was supposed to be y1 larger than y2, y the small epsilon. Uh, and by doing that, we can ensure that any feasible point that's going to, any point that's going to be determined is going to be inside this green area. Uh, that is, uh, all of it is included in the true feasible region. So um, we tested that on the, on the 14 bar system. Um, and as you see here is how we increase the epsilon. Uh, for different values of epsilon, you can see the share of uh, the instances when we run the optimal power flow uh, that uh, returned a feasible optimal point. So you see that with no conservativeness here, so with the original uh, feasible region, then about um, we get about 56% uh, of the optimally determined points of the or of the determined optimal optimal points have been uh, uh, feasible. Uh, but if we uh, increase this conservativeness by epsilon equal to eight, then, and this eight is actually specific for this, for the system, right? Uh, then we, we get 100% of the instances uh, return an optimal point that's also feasible, right? Now, with blue dots, we also plot uh, what, is, what is this impact on the objective cost function, right? The objective uh, of the objective function. So you see that of course, since we become more conservative, the, the, cost of, uh, the uh, cost of the objective function increases. But if you see this increase is actually very, very uh, uh, small. Now, let's uh, go and see uh, the second challenge. Uh, the second challenge uh, has to do with how we handle the nonlinear equality constraints. So in, power, in the power system optimization problem, we have equality constraints that are quadratic. There are three solutions to avoid solving a mixed integer nonlinear problem because these equality constraints that are nonlinear make our, our, our problem a mixed integer nonlinear program. The first is we can train a regression neural network, enter the input P and V, uh, and then get the output of Q and theta. So through this estimation, we can have a set of linear weights and uh, RLU. So these max operators, so we can convert this regression also to a set of mixed integer linear um, constraints. Uh, we haven't tried that yet. We don't know how uh, computationally efficient will be. What we have tried is first of all to convexify. So we can convexify these equality constraints. And that's what we did for the decision trees, right? And we had then a mixed integer second order cone program. What we will show here is uh, that we can also linearize these nonlinear equations and solve this MILP iteratively. So instead of just solving once the MILP, we might solve it, let's say, two times and uh, um, uh, co quickly converge to uh, uh, a solution that satisfies these equality constraints if it's also feasible for, for the MILP. So indeed, we did that. Um, we had to replace uh, this N nonlinear constraints, where N is the number of nodes, the number of buses with only one linearized constraint uh, that focused on the total active power nodal balance. And this worked very well for us. It was surprisingly well. So we solved 125 different instances. And on average, our problem converts with, uh, in 1.04 iterations. So in the first iteration, uh, so the first time we solved the, the, the MILP, we had a solution that was feasible also for this nonlinear equality constraints. And at the maximum, we, we uh, recorded only two iterations. So, so within two iterations, we got uh, a, a solution 
uh, that is feasible for the MILP and for these nonlinear uh, equalities. Uh, so let's go and see some results. So here I have this table. Uh, the first uh, two uh, problems uh, correspond to a nonlinear program. So this is what, uh, usually based on interior point, this is what, uh, how SCOPF would be solved now. The environmental fund security has a lot more constraints, right? So this, the, SCOPF, the original SCOPF has only maybe 10% of the constraints uh, when uh, compared with the NMAN security, security that we have to consider all possible contingencies happening in this system, right? And that's why you see that this different the difference in the solver time. The, the lower two uh, rows uh, correspond to the neural networks where we handle ACOPF, so the, the, the original power flow constraints and the component limits, plus n man n security, plus small signal stability, right? So the first thing uh, I would like to discuss is the, the solution time. So you see that the solution time is comparable. Uh, uh, the solution of this MILP is comparable to the time that is being used to solve a security constraint, ACOPF. But at this time, we don't only have the static security, so the n one but we also consider at the same time also the small signal stability, right? The second thing I want to discuss is about this conservativeness that we uh, also uh, showed earlier. As, as you see with a, 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 a slightly more conservative uh, feasible region, uh, then we can uh, obtain 100% of the time. So over all 125 instances, a feasible solution that if you see is not so much uh, more expensive than uh, when we get an absolute equal to zero, right? Um, so these are all uh, average uh, uh, costs after running that for 125 uh, different instances. So this brings me to the uh, conclusions of, of this presentation. So as we have seen from, uh, uh, we can uh, get an exact transformation uh, for the information encoded in decision trees and neural networks and get it into a mixed integer linear program. And by doing that, we can capture efficiently constraints that were previously intractable, for okay? example. So as I also mentioned, this, the same kind of procedure or similar procedure, I say not the same, applies also for neural network verification, we have, where we have also done some work for uh, when it comes to fire system applications. Now, the challenges that are, are still remaining is that um, how we handle the nonlinear equality constraint. Uh, in, in the case that we have studied, second order cone program uh, or a linearization appear effective um, and also how to make sure that we have accurately captured the feasible space and here we have showed that we can do that with the in, uh, by introducing this epsilon conservativeness uh, one more uh, uh, one benefit of this approach is also that uh, it might be much more scalable uh, comparing to just adding constraint after constraint in a nonlinear program if we uh, train a neural network for a set of very, um, for a, a, a large set of different constraints and uh, infer the, the, the feasible space, then this might be much more scalable, so might need less constraints than um, uh, for the original nonlinear program. This is something that we haven't looked into detail yet, but it's part of our future work. So this framework that I presented can apply to any non to any nonlinear program and not only to power systems. But of course, uh, in this case, uh, we, we have shown an example based on, on power system since this is also my main focus and my background. So by that, I would like to, to thank you uh, for attending this presentation and uh, um, I, I will be happy to address any questions that you might have uh, during the session. Thank you, thank you very much.